Okay. Um, so what I thought we what I thought we'd do this time is actually just present a few little bit more common diseases, and what we'll try to do is to to uh, present a case and then discuss it a little bit. And so feel free. I, I'm going to ask you guys questions or throw it out there. Please feel free to jump in. You guys shouldn't be embarrassed or, or shy to speak up. Okay, so this is a patient of mine who, is, uh, who I started treating many years ago. She was, 40, she was 46 at the time. She complained about blurred vision, uh, right eye worse than left. It was sudden onset. Um, it had happened for a few days. And she also said that uh, around this time, she felt like when she was listening to people, everybody sounded like they were underwater. So I'm going to tell the, the residents from Brazil cannot answer this question. Yeah. Okay? So anybody else, just off the top of your head, what do we see here? Uh, there are some subretinal fluid. Yes, good. So subretinal fluid, what else is there? You can see some uh, pigmented lesions or some hyperfluorescent pigmented, small hyperpigmented lesions around the optic nerve and optic fluorescence or uh, FA. Yeah. And so I think that's good. So, so what we're seeing here is... Uh, and the disc is also blurry, so maybe there is some vitritis. Yeah, there may be there may be some hazy some media. I think that's probably because the focus is more here on this uh, serous retinal detachment. There's a very soon a large serous retinal detachment. The fluorescein angiograms shows multiple areas of punctate hyperfluorescence, right? So what's the uh, patient ethnicity? The patient's ethnicity. She is uh, she's from Guam actually. So she's I don't know how to describe it. She's uh, not. She's not Hispanic. She's actually, well, she's, she's half Asian. She has a uh, Filipino blood. So, so could why, be, why was he asking about ethnicity? It can help you isolate uh, something along like, something like VKH versus Bichette or something right. like that. Yeah, so if you think back to uh, Dr. Wong's slide, where he had on, on one side, he had the, the Silk Road route. On the other side, he had two arrows, right, showing uh, promise. So this is VKH. Um, and that's it. And the reason I didn't want the residents from Brazil to answer is because it's actually, I think, the most common cause of non-infectious uveitis in, in Brazil, Saudi Arabia as well, is VKH. And so, what is VKH? So VKH, as far as we know, it's a multi-system disorder, but we aren't really sure what the exact nature of the disease is. It's probably been around for a long time. Um, but we think that there's definitely T-cell mediated disease. It's probably directed against uh, antigens associated with melanocytes. We don't know what the trigger for that is. It may be some people have talked about cutaneous injury. Some people have talked about a viral infection. Um, and there is a genetic susceptibility to uh, these triggering. There's a high association with HLA-DR1 as well as HLA-DR4. And uh, we know that this occurs more often in darkly pigmented uh, patients with, uh, with, dark, uh, sorry, with dark, darkly pigmented patients. Um, but and it occurs uncommonly on Caucasian patients. But in sub-Saharan African patients, we also don't see it that often. So it's more than just the pigment, right? There's other factors that are contributing to the development of this disease. VKH has stages to it. Uh, the first stage is prodromal, followed by an acute uveitic phase, which is where the patients will usually present. Uh, convalescent phase, and then a chronic recurrent uh, stage after that. I'll just go through. So at the prodromal phase, people typically will have like a flu-like illness. They may have headache, meningitis symptoms. They may complain of tinnitus. In the case of our patient, she had disacusis. So central disacusis, usually with a loss of the higher frequencies, occurs in about 30% of patients with VKH. Most of those patients will recover that hearing after about two to three months, but there are some patients for whom that will be persistent. There is more of a permanent high-frequency hearing loss. Patients may also complain about scalp or skin hypersensitivity. And about one to two days or several days later, they'll develop this acute uveitic phase. And during this time, what you'll see is usually a bilateral granulomatous anterior uveitis. There's a variable vitritis. Patients will have a thickening of the posterior choroid. If you do a B-scan or a, a hands depth imaging on OCT, you'll see an increase in the choroidal thickness. Um, they may then have multiple serous detachments. Quite often, the serous detachments are multiple within the posterior pole, maybe forming almost like a clover leaf type pattern centrally. Um, but if they continue, if, if the leakage continues, then they'll develop 
these larger uh, bullous serous detachments as you saw in this patient. The anterior chamber also may shallow. And this is an important point, not just for VKH, but other types of UVDVs as well. You want to be, uh, you know, the, oftentimes you may see patients late at night, you're seeing them as a shallow chamber, you're thinking it's, it's a uh, angle closure glaucoma. You want to resist the temptation in those patients to put in an LPI because you'll probably make things worse. Oftentimes giving them steroids, addressing the inflammation, you know, you'll see the anterior chamber deepen and everything sort of retract. And the shallow anterior chamber may come about either because of an annular spinal <coughs> detachment or ciliary body edema, both of which can compress and push the iris lens diaphragm forward. This is an OCT. So one of the, what would be the differential diagnosis for uh, serous subretinal fluid besides VKH? What, what other common condition? What about the Stanford residents? What do you see on all these Silicon Valley high stress types? Serous. Yeah. yeah, you might see central serous. So how are you gonna differentiate? I mean, there are obviously other factors that you may get from the history or other uveitic things, but what, on an OCT, are there any findings that might distinguish central serous from VKH? Yeah, so sometimes you'll see these fibrin strands between the retina and the RPE within, within that uh, fluid. Okay. Back. Yeah, so you can't see, sometimes you'll see these sort of strands or you'll see more fibrin in that. After the acute phase, uh, the patient then will go into a convalescent phase. And it's here where the sort of prototypical depigmentation of other tissues will occur. So this is that same patient. This is her, I think, about 15 years later. And you can see that she has extensive vitiligo. This is her eye here. Uh, in fact, these were taken just yesterday. But this is, um, this is her poliosis as well. And you can see that there's extensive depigmentation in the choroid, forming what we call sunset glow fundus, sort of this orangish coloration. Okay. After the convalescent phase, they may then go into a chronic recurrent phase where they have a granulomatous anterior uveitis. Posterior, recurrent posterior uveitis is generally rare, although it can occur, uh, but patients usually will not continue to develop recurrent serous detachments and recur recurrent uh, choroidal thickening. At this phase, the inflammation may be steroid dependent or it may even be steroid resistant. So some people will advocate for earlier intervention with immunomodulatory therapy. And I think Foster, it was Foster's paper, correct, that showed that early intervention with IMT was beneficial in patients with BKH. Um, <clears throat> The other thing is that in, in these patients, when you're, when you're diagnosing them, you want to make sure that there's no history of ocular trauma or surgery preceding uveitis. Why? Sympathetic ophthalmia, right? So you want to make sure that there's not, because they can look very similar. Um, you also want to make sure that there's no evidence of other diseases. So in the last couple of years, uh, patients have been start, started to treat melanoma with immunotherapy. And ipilimumab has been shown to cause a VKH-like syndrome. And in fact, some of the other immunotherapies have done that as well. Many years ago, there was a paper with someone who had developed melanoma, and the VKH syndrome was actually the first sign of that recurrence of melanoma in those patients. So again, you always want to sort of keep that in mind when you're evaluating them. Patients, uh, VKH is a bilateral disease. There are cases reported where it's unilateral, but most often you're going to have it, it's a bilateral disease. And in general, as I said before, the integumentary findings, the skin findings, poliosis, they don't precede uveitis, they follow uveitis, they'll come in the convalescent period. Treatment strategies, systemic steroids are important. Oftentimes we'll start by giving them intravenous solumedrol. It's better to be heavy handed at the beginning of these cases to get them under control and then taper. If you uh, start patients on lower dose steroids and then try to ramp up, they'll just prolong their disease and sometimes it becomes more difficult to control later. So be aggressive at the beginning. A slow taper of steroids, systemic steroids, is recommended. Um, I'll usually use about six months, but try to get them down to a level uh, as, as much as possible, down to about 10 milligrams a day, uh, or set seven and a half to 10 milligrams a day, but I will keep them on that low dose steroid for six months, even if they're on immunomodulatory therapy. There are some studies to show that that length of time or duration of treating them with systemic steroids is beneficial in terms of preventing vision loss long term. 
Immunomodulatory therapy, as I had uh, mentioned earlier, may be beneficial to start at the beginning if you recognize that this is a patient, especially if they're younger patients. Um, you know, you want to try to avoid, or if they, if they're someone that has diabetes or Crohn's diabetes, if they're heavily overweight, you may want to start immunomodulatory therapy earlier to minimize their steroid burden. All right, so I'll move on to the next case. This is a 60-year old oh, resident. Yeah. So, question about the previous case. Yeah. Do you treat them with a pulse steroid therapy? Sometimes admit them, give them, because I've seen patient at Proctor that started one gram a day for a couple of days. Yes, yeah, so IV solutions, so if I'm gonna go to IV solutions medrol, I'll usually give them one gram a day for, for two to three days, and then start them on oral steroids afterwards. Um, I think that in Japan, where it's a, it's a slightly different, there, it's a more homogenous population, but they oftentimes will give them They'll pulse them for for a little bit, uh, I think a few days, and then they don't do anything. They'll, they'll pulse them again like a month later, which can be effective there. I think, though, I would agree with you. I usually will pulse them with one gram for a few days at the beginning, and then give them oral steroids after that. So this is a, the second case. So this is a 60-year-old gentleman uh, who was referred to me for three uh, three-week history of pain re and redness and tenderness palpation in the left eye. Um, you can see here that there's uh, redness over the superior, maybe about 10 to 2, 10 to 3 here. And also, uh, temporally in this eye, he had uh, tenderness right over the lateral rectus muscle with injection there. And what you can do is, if when patients, so this, were, this is a scoritis patient. One, uh, sort of technique when you're examining patients in the clinic is to use the red free filter on the slit lamp. So if you use the red free filter, the green light, it will actually throw the blood vessels into better relief and you'll get a more three-dimensional view and you can tell exactly where the vessels are inflamed. So whether it's episcleral, scleral, or conjunctival, it'll give you a little bit better view. So the next time you're in clinic and you have that, try that and see, see, what, uh, see what you can see, but you'll actually get a better sense for whether it's scleritis or conjunctivitis. So again, we have a 60-year-old male. He has anterior scleritis, myositis of the left eye. But and, and, you know, when we talk to him about his history and rejuvenative systems, he's had a chronic cough, he has rhinorrhea, he's had intermittent epistaxis. And in fact, a month earlier, he had been hospitalized for a bleeding gastric ulcer. So we did testing for him, and his ANCA came back positive for proteinase 3, which is more specific for granulomatosis with polyangitis. He also had microscopic hematuria, okay, which is suggestive that he had renal involvement as well. Interestingly, uh, there are a few papers that show that a bleeding gastric ulcer can be the presenting sign of, of uh, granulomatosis with polyangitis. It's not common, but it does happen. So granulomatosis with polyangitis, formerly uh, known as Wegner's syndrome, is a multi-system disorder. It can involve multiple systems, including the uh, pulmonary system, uh, sinuses, glomerular and uh, renal system, as well as small vessel vasculitis. It's most common, uh, most commonly will involve the paranasal sinuses, followed by pulmonary uh, vasculitis, and then glomerular nephritis, renal vasculitis. So 85% of these patients will develop glomerular nephritis, which carries a high morbidity, all right? So it's important, and the eyes can be the presenting sign in these diseases. So you never want to miss this, because you can really uh, impact someone's life positively by making the diagnosis. And in this case, the patient had already had other complications that no one had really picked up that it might be GPA. Um, the one-year mortality previously without any treatment was 80%. We're much better uh, now that we have cytoxin and rituxin. Uh, the mortality has gone down significantly. At the time of presentation, only about 15% of these patients will present with just eye involvement. They usually will have other things going on, but a not insignificant number of them uh, will develop eye involvement over the course of their disease. Only about 10% of them will have uveitis. Most of the time, this disease is going to be scleritis, episcleritis, or keratitis. Always check ANCA, and usually you want C -ANCA, uh, C -ANCA, <coughs> cyclosmic, C ANCA. Uh, MPO and PR3 subsets in patients with scleritis. This is really important. Okay? You definitely do not want to miss this. And you don't want to miss this question on your boards. Less importantly, but you don't want to miss it on your boards either because they will 
Um, all right, any questions about GPA? Great, so we'll move on to this case. So this is a 33-year-old woman, African-American, uh, had complaints of fever, productive cough, headache, and presented with uh, slowly progressive, blurred vision, redness of her eyes. So given the symptoms that she has, we're thinking it's more of an insidious onset, right? If it was a sudden onset, she might have more pain, redness, light sensitivity. So we think this has been going on for some time. When we look at her eyes, uh, so I'll go to the easy one here, which is you can see small granulomatous keratic precipitate. There's some posterior synechia. Again, all indicative of a more chronic process. But what do we see here? Nodules on iris? Yeah, iris nodules. So Dr. Wong just went over what kind of what kind of nodules are those? The, the Vesaka. So Vesaka nodules are usually on the iris. Stroma kepi nodules are at the pupillary margin, right? So it's probably a mixture. It's hard to tell whether uh, this one is sort of a kepi or it's probably more. Vesaka nodules tend to be more specific for granulomatous, granulomatous disease. Um, but again, those are that, there's nothing subtle about those nodules. Every first year medical student is going to see those, right? So again, this is most likely a granulomatous disease. It's sort of insidious in onset. African American women in the United States. So we're going to think about sarcoidosis in these patients. So sarcoidosis, at least in the U.S., should always be in the differential. It's interesting that we always think about it as a disease afflicting African Americans, but if you go to Europe. It's actually more common in you know, the it's actually fairly common in Caucasian populations there too. Um, most of the time, sarcoidosis will be and will affect the uvea anteriorly, but posterior involvement also is not uncommon. Um, patients will typically have mutton fat keratic precipitates, and they may have high other forms of uh, other signs of granulomatous disease, including iris nodules. Sarcoid can involve the lacrimal gland, so we typically think about lacrimal gland enlargement. We can also notice that there are peripheral, peripheral keratic precipitates here, and it's interesting that they go, you see these above that sort of three to nine equatorial, or three to nine midline that uh, Dr. Wong had described. And if you look, if you do gonioscopy, Oftentimes you'll see tent-shaped peripheral anterior synechia, or you'll see these nodules in the trabecular meshwork. Those are called Berlin nodules, and they may be more specific. You may be more specific for sarcoidosis in those uh, in those cases. But this is a pattern, uh, and certainly the other faculty should weigh in. This is a pattern that I've seen most often in patients with sarcoid. I haven't seen it too much in patients that, that don't typically have that. I think so, but I wasn't sure whether people had seen this in other diseases as well. Okay, so this is nodules, I'll skip this, we'll discuss this. Patients with chronic disease can develop bank keratopathy and patients with sarcoid exception. Um, sometimes the bank keratopathy can be so severe as to occlude view of the anterior chamber. In these cases, certainly EDTA chelation and removal of bank keratopathy may be worthwhile to get to better assess what's going on with the rest of the eye. Granulomas can develop at any level within the eye, and here optic nerve granulomas uh, are not common, but they can occur certainly in patients with sarcoidosis. Interestingly, you would think in some of these cases patients will lose significant amounts of vision uh, when the granuloma occurs, and you would think that like other diseases of the optic nerve, when you treat them, they might not get everything back, but the visual recovery oftentimes is very good once you treat them. They can also develop uh, vasculitis, including periphlebitis uh, around the retinal vessels, and they may develop something called candle wax drippings. Uh, I won't pronounce the French name because my French is terrible, but um, they, these are nodular granulomas along the venules and represent a perivasculitis. Sarcoidosis can be asymptomatic, which is why we also always need to consider it in patients uh, that present with uveitis, because it can present as any type of uveitis, and the patients might not have any symptoms in those cases. 
Most often, though, 90% uh, of patients will have pulmonary or chest involvement, but that can be transient. So sometimes they may have chest x-ray findings at some point in their course, but it may not be at the time when ediatus is presented. There are two conditions that are typically talked about on uh, within the basic science series and on your boards. We'll talk about Hereford syndrome. These patients will have uveitis, uh, parotitis, fever, and facial nerve palsy. And the reason I put that in red is the seventh nerve is the most commonly involved cranial nerve in sarcoidosis. So we've had some patients who develop uveitis later on. They've had multiple different systemic complaints, but they had a facial nerve palsy at one time. Definitely consider sarcoid in those patients. The second condition is Lofgren syndrome, which is erythema nodosum, febrile arthropathy, hyalolymphadenopathy, and acute iritis. Uh, these patients tend to get better and respond pretty quickly to steroids. So sarcoidosis ultimately is a tissue diagnosis, and you're going to try to get tissue from wherever you can. The classic uh, thing is to do uh, bronchoscopy and, and biopsy the lymph nodes. But if you can find other tissues, say skin lesions or conjunctival nodules, then you can oftentimes save the patient a procedure. So what you see here on the left are conjunctival nodules that were biopsied. This patient did have sarcoidosis. Sometimes the nodules will actually be on the vulvar conjunctiva as well. And so, uh, if, so be careful to look for that. That's one reason why even in uveitis patients, you want to be careful about looking for at the fornices, look at the vulvar conjunctiva, flip the lids. I always tell the residents to flip the lids on all of the patients. You want to look for everything possible. Any clue you can get as to what's going on is important. Chest x-ray is, is the most sensitive uh, test I believe we have based on sort of the sarcoid, international uh, sarcoid working group. But um, oftentimes, as I said, the hyalolymphadenopathy may not be present at the time that you diagnose the uveitis. In older women, uh, chest CT scan, or in patients where there's a high index of suspicion, a chest CT scan is more valuable. There were a study, Kryn Louder from Cleveland Clinic, I think, had a study several years ago pointing out that uh, older Caucasian women that didn't have a diagnosis for their uveitis, had, uh, they were able to get better results by doing uh, spiral, spiral CT or thin cut CT scans and diagnosing sarcoid in those patients. Um, ACE is neither sensitive nor specific in these cases, as Dr. Long pointed out. ACE, lysozyme, and then there's another uh, another a serologic test called serum interleukin-2 receptor, which has been associated with uh, elevated in pulmonary sarcoid, but none of these seem to really track uveitis as well, and so it's questionable whether there's a benefit to doing these. Uh, they can be supportive, but it's unlikely that they're going to be diagnostic. This is a 30-year-old Caucasian woman who I had seen two years ago complained of missing spots in her vision. So if we look here, we can see hemorrhages along some of the vessels. There's probably a little bit of inflammation here. There's some what appears to be possibly retinitis or retinal whitening. Maybe there's some cotton wool spots as well. We see something similar in the left eye, although not quite as prominent. About a month earlier, or six weeks before she presented to our clinic, she was hospitalized for fever of unknown origin. She'd been treated with broad spectrum antibiotics and developed multiple complications from that, ultimately requiring about two weeks of inpatient hospitalization. Uh, when she was released, she came to see us looking for a reason as to why her vision had declined. So if you look at her FA, what do we see here on her face, just broadly? If you look at the peripheral retina, here. Non right, there's decreased perfusion or lack of perfusion there, right? You see some pruning of the vessels as well. This one gives you a little bit better view. But that's it's pretty prominent. It's not subtle that there's there's a lack of perfusion to the temporal retina here. And also I think within the uh, macula in that area of whitening we see the same thing. On OCT, we can see that there's uh, some increased reflectivity in the inner retina, probably some loss of some of the structures there. The outer retina seems to be 
reasonably well preserved, but definitely there's some alterations there, suggestive that, it, which is consistent with a retinal vascularity. So I bring this up because this is another patient, and Dr. Wang already covered this, but this is another patient who has the same disease, That's right. he's presented a different way. So this is a, you see a hypopian here. So in the United States, when we have a hypopian, what's the most common cause? HA? Uh, HLA B27. Oh, so. Yeah. And then in, but you should also think about infections, right? So if the patient has a recent history of uh, surgery, if the patient's had any kind of systemic illness, think about endophthalmitis as well. But in this patient, what's notable is that although the, although the patient has a significant hypopian and angiochamber cell, the eye is not that hot. The patient's not in as much pain. So patients, some of the patients with Bichette's, they can have a, a hypopian without having that much pain, without the eye being very red. And if you, if you have them positioned, if you have them lie down, it's almost like a snow globe. You'll see that the, the hypopian slides to wherever gravity is pulling it. And if you have them shake their heads a lot, it'll, it'll sort of fluff out into the uh, anterior chamber and then settle down again as well. So this patient, my patient, the previous one, and this one as well, both had uh, Bichette's. And so you can see here, this is that retinal, retinal whitening here. And so Bichette's is a multi-system disorder. Again, it affects, uh, can affect almost any organ. Uh, classically think about it with patients along the silt road route, but these days with uh, people can trace their heritage back to uh, any, any number of countries. And our patient actually, the first one, what has a history of the Italian heritage, so probably that's where it, uh, she derived it. When we're talking about Bichette disease, when we're diagnosing it, there's multiple different criteria to diagnose this. I usually use the international uh, study group criteria because it's the easiest one for me to remember, which is, does the patient have oral ulcers? And usually these oral aptic ulcers, they're gonna be small, two to 15 millimeters, multiple, white with red rims. They're, pain, they, they're oftentimes painful. Um, they'll last seven to 10 days. And patients typically will describe multiple episodes over a year. So the criteria here is usually they want three or more times a year plus two of the following. So they also want involvement of genital ulceration. Oral ulcers don't scar, but the genital ulcers will. So even if they don't have genital ulcers at the time, and sometimes the, those ulcers are not necessarily painful, um, if, if you examine it, you sometimes will find scarring. In men, it's on the scrotum, women on the vulva, or in the vaginal mucosa. You can get ocular inflammation. Skin lesions also can occur. And the pathology tests, they put down as a, as a criteria. We don't typically do it. Um, and I think it's only about 40% of patients will actually have a positive pathology test. So again, systemic involvement, about 25% of them will have systemic vasculitis. They may, this may include cardiac, gastrointestinal, and pulmonary complications. Half of them will develop arthritis during the course of their disease. And about, and, and most devastatingly, about uh, patients can get neurologic complications. So you think of CNS vasculitis. And in patients with ocular bichette, about 30% of them will develop neurologic disease. Okay, so, so that is very important if, again, if you're seeing patients with uh, bichette disease and ocular complications, that they're being, that their neurologic, uh, any neurologic issues are being addressed as well, and that that's being monitored. Ocular manifestations affect the majority of uh, Bichette patients. More than 80% of those that are affected are gonna be bilateral. Um, and typically, the way to think about it is, again, a necrotizing of liver vasculitis of different parts of the uterus tissue. When it affects the posterior segment, oftentimes it's gonna be an obliterative retinal vasculitis affecting both arteries and veins. Patients can have a chalky white retina in those areas, which can oftentimes be mistaken for arm or retinitis. Um, and this posterior panuveitis occurs in probably 50 to 80% of Bichette's uh, patients, but patients with Bichette-associated uveitis. So this is our patient, uh, the 30-year-old woman, about, eight months or nine months after her initial complication. 
And what we notice now is that she's developing neovascularization. So this is a complication of posterior segment involvement in Bichette's disease, and you have to monitor for it. This is her after placement of PRP. You can see that it's not enough. The neovascularization hasn't really regressed that much. So she, at this time, was given more PRP and then switched over to anti-VEGF intravitreal agents. All right, any questions about Bichette? And before I go, this will be the last case. So uh, she was, so at that time she was on mycophenolate. I mean, I think that the, the development of the evacuation was largely just a result of the chronic ischemia uh, without any progression of her inflammation. And mycophenolate was a decision based on her rheumatologist, uh, whether or not she should have gotten rituxan or something a little bit stronger. It's, I, I sort of tried to push for it, but I think the patient insisted. All right, so our last case is an 11-year-old uh, Caucasian boy who has a years-long history of bilateral non-granulomatous erythrocyclitis. You can see he has on, here on the left is his, this is his right eye here and his left eye. Both eyes had trace or 0.5 plus anterior chamber cell. Uh, the right eye obviously seems to be less affected than the, the left eye. The left eye, you can see posterior sneakia, cataract, band keratopathy as well. So in this patient, what do you guys, what's the most common cause, uh, associated condition with anterior uveitis in Jordan? Uh, J. Yeah, J. So even though, you, you know, they, I presented the patient, even though the patient's 11 years old, which is a little bit old for that condition, he's had the condition for a number of years, right? So the patient generally is controlled with topical corticosteroids, but the steroids cause elevated intraocular pressure. Uh, patient had been on therapy. This was, and this case is from a number of years ago, so at that time, biologics were not in widespread use for children, but he was on methotrexate and cyclosporin. You can see that the patient is still on a high dose of oral prednisone, and so still needs additional immunomodulatory therapy to get him down. He had significant vision loss with elevated intraocular pressure, trace APD, which is probably due to glaucoma even though his visual field competition is full. So the patient had uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So JIA is, uh, has an incidence of about two to 13 cases per 100,000 per year. Um, prevalence is probably about 16 to 113 cases, with, including both active and quiet blessing. There are different rheumatologies uh, Societies that have tried to classify uh, JIA, and we typically think about the uh, typically think about the uh, American College of Rheumatology, where we talk about systemic polyarticular and poly, uh, polyarticular. But often now we're switching over to the the international um, rheumatology classifications of systemic and oligoarticular, as well as RF negative polyarticular and positive polyarticular. So with this slide, what I wanted to show you was that uh, the incidence of, or the, the prevalence of anterior uveitis is highest in this ANA positive group, okay, that has oligoarthritis or polyarthritis. And because of that higher incidence or the higher prevalence of anterior uveitis in those patients, we oftentimes will recommend more close, closely monitoring those patients every three months if there's no involvement, okay? Versus, say, patients with systemic disease have very low involvement of the eyes, and so we monitor them once a year. Ocular complications tend to increase the longer the patients have the disease. So um, the more number of years, they tend to get more complications over time. The most common complications are band keratopathy and cataract, and those are the most common reasons for reduction in vision. You can see that over time, the outcomes have gotten better, and part of that is likely due to the fact that we're immunosuppressing these patients earlier and keeping them on steroids for a shorter amount of time, if possible. Glaucoma, likewise, struck a significant number of the JIA patients versus other uh, pediatric uveitis patients. 
Patients with ANA positivity had a much higher rate of glaucoma than the ANA negative patients. Sinekia seemed to be a uh, negative, or seemed to be a uh, negative predictor for remission in these patients. So if, if they have Sinekia, and that's probably an indicator for chronicity of inflammation before uh, treatment or before presentation, they tended to sort of stall out they tended to stall out uh, right around 80% in terms of the uh, percent of patients that still had disease that were not remission, that were not in remission. Versus no synechia, these patients over time tended to get better. Visual morbidity is common, so they oftentimes will, the rate of blindness is about 10% per person here. Ocular complications likewise are common, two thirds of them will have complications at presentation, but the rate is almost 40% per year, per person year. So with these patients, the reason to bring all these things up is not to discourage you uh, that there's nothing to do for these patients, but that you don't want to sit on these on these kids. You don't want to just wait and treat them with drops and see how they do over time. It's better to be more aggressive early, get the rheumatologist involved, try, try to explain to them that they need to be more aggressive about uh, controlling the inflammation rather than sort of uh, saying the arthritis is okay, but not to worry about the uveitis. We talked a little bit before, someone had asked a question about topical steroids, I think how, what, keeping them on, or I think you'd said, all right, keeping a thousand drops a year, you thought was reasonable. Uh, so we actually did a study on, on the JIA patients, and when we looked at that, we found that three times a day or less, there were actually, there was no development of cataract over one year in our population of JIA patients. So again, that goes right along with that about 1,000 drops per year. Um, oops, sorry. So the last thing is that uh, risk factors for vision loss include AC flare, posterior synechia, abnormal IOP that was both very low and very high. Both of those were uh, negatively affected the outcome uh, or negatively predicted the outcome and any history of prior surgery. All of those patients tended to do worse than I think this is this topic has already been sort of explained to that, but we've explained we've emphasized it enough. But especially in children, keeping them on chronic steroids is, is really not the best idea for them. Children also, you know, even if you think I can always do cataract surgery for them if they develop cataract, no big deal. Kids don't do as well with ocular surgery as adults do. So the better thing is to avoid surgery in those patients if you can. And with that, I'll conclude. I think I ran a little bit over my time. Sorry, Claude. No problem. Any uh, questions? So here's a question for the uh, faculty here. So many of you in your career, especially in your care sector, have come up with this part where you may need to do cataract uh, surgery in these children with uh, <coughs> JAA because of various aspects. So here's a question for Dr. Juan David and, and Sunday Gates. Would you or would you not put it in your upper lens when you do patients with JA and so did cataract? Granted that you will keep the uveitis very quiet before you do the surgery. So how, which one of you did it? Would you put a lens in? So we had a all of those subjects in the facility. Those that had a chronic flare uh, in the upper cell in KC, those patients did not do it. So if there's a Thirty-four years ago, we 
hotel and very little sweat. I see a lot of sweat. I would prefer something in the But if I had maybe a fake sweat, I wouldn't have to worry about it. I definitely would have. Yeah, no, I, I, mean, I agree with, agree with those, those comments. Of, I think you have to gauge it based on how important it is. If it's just that your control is brittle, you're not, you don't really have very good control or they have any of the other signs, lots of places are smooth to you. I mean, it, what you endowed is what you endowed, in my opinion, is better than you, you don't put it in rather than you put it in because you can always put it in like a secondary IOL after you've been seeing um, correction in the score. But I think putting the lens in when the case like there like this is very headache because you can end up getting sleepy eye and just deposit in there. Don't worry about it. And on the question of flares, actually, this is something we quite very much interested in. So, as you know, uh, we grade flare based on subjective finding whether you go from zero to one, two, three, and so on and so forth. So, so recently, uh, well, in the United States, we don't address this issue very well, but in the Europe and in Asia, there's actually a very important part of flare. So there's actually a flare device right now where you actually can measure flare quite actively. It's manufactured by this uh, Japanese uh, company called Kawa, K-O-W-A. And we actually do a very good large study right now, sample at the ISC field. Uh, and we look at the correlation between assessment from clinical assessment versus uh, the assessment using the flare meter. And uh, in the way that we're testing ourselves to see how well and we, uh, what we're trying to do right now, this is a very important aspect to just what we're trying to do. What is the role of flare in predicting the outcome of the course of management, and in this case, the course of surgical intervention as well? So flare, sometimes you get to the call, but it becomes more important aspect from this, both for anterior segment as well as for posterior segment disease as well. Thank you. But this question of cataract surgery uh, in there, remember, the lens can look really great at the time of surgery. If you put it in, it looks great. But then starting on course of week number two, you begin to see problems. So if you see any of these signs that you, when you endow, it's better that you don't put it in. Because otherwise, you'll be regretting it later on how to get out and get chronic inflammation forever. So instead of 15, we get five minute break. So please get out, get out, and get some break, and we'll be back about 